We're ready to start. Looks like it's on. Okay. Well, good afternoon. My name is Ray Diamond. Some of you know me as a professor here at LSU's law school. I'm also the director of the George and Jean Pugh Institute for Justice. And my job here today uh, is to stand in for Dean Allen, uh, who is out of town doing what good deans do, raising money for the law school. So my job is to stand in for her and welcome you to this celebration of Constitution Day. The primary sponsor of this celebration is the Eric Vogelin Institute. Uh, it was established in 1987 to honor uh, Eric Vogelin, one of the greatest teacher scholars in the history of this university. A refugee from Nazi Germany and dismissed from the University of Vienna in 1938 because of his resolute scholarly opposition to Adolf Hitler. He became one of the first three Boyd professors at LSU and is now recognized as one of the premier intellectuals of the 20th century. Professor Vogelin would deem today's conversation on the Constitution and American democracy to be entirely appropriate and necessary. We Americans are bound not by religion, not by region or party, not by race or ethnicity. We are bound by our constitution and the rights and structures that it imposes. For we all perform our constitution in the way and the freedom with which we worship, in which we speak on issues, in which we speak to praise and criticize our leaders, in ingesting our news in the way that we make requests of and demands on our representatives. We perform our constitution when we are armed. We perform it in our expectations of freedom from unreasonable behavior by police and prosecutors, when we vote, when we expect our votes will be counted, when we expect that our votes can have the chance to make a difference. We perform our constitution when we expect that our winning candidates will take office and perform responsibly and that our losing candidates will accept the results and moan in disappointment at and wistful imaginings of the loss of an opportunity to serve, but with the hope of another opportunity in the future. We have an exciting speaker here today to lead our conversation on the Constitution and American democracy. And to introduce him, we have Professor James Stoner, political science professor and the director of the Eric Vogelin Institute. Thank you very much for your attention. I am looking so much forward to hearing what the panel has to say. Well, thank you very much, Professor Diamond, for uh, that warm and thoughtful welcome. And uh, thank you for the support you've given over the years as a participant in these programs and the support from the Pew Institute here at the law school. Thanks also to the law school for hosting us and especially to the Jack Miller Center, which has provided the funding for today's event, or at least much of the funding for today's event and has provided hundreds of copies of the pocket copies of the constitution of the United States and declaration of independence. So don't leave here without one. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce today our Constitution Day speaker, Professor Joshua Sellers, now of the University of Texas Law School. Professor Sellers has widely published uh, in the field, especially of election law and constitutional law, um, and has won awards for his publication and was honored most recently by the Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin 
uh, and and it's through that German connection that we act, that he actually came to our attention, Professor Marchand, uh, one of the current Boyd professors at LSU, having uh, met Professor Sellers there, and dropped me a note and said, "I found your Constitution Day speaker." Uh, before uh, becoming a law professor, Professor Sellers clerked for Judge Rosemary Barkett of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, and uh, was an associate at Jenner and Block, one of the major firms in Washington, DC. He holds a JD and a PhD as well in political science. I was especially impressed by that second degree. Um, from the University of Chicago, that's a joke, I'm a political scientist, you know, we, sometimes we can praise our own, um, where he served uh, as articles editor of uh, the University of Chicago Law Review, and he holds a BA in political science and Afro-American and African studies from the University of Michigan. Commenting on Professor Sellers' talk will be Professor John Devlin of the Law School, who joined the LSU faculty even before I did. <laughs> uh, Professor Devlin um, clerked for the Honorable Eugene Nickerson uh, in the Eastern District of New York some years ago, and has taught constitutional law and federal law more generally here at the law school and coaches the Law Center National Moot Court team, uh, which I understand has kept him out all week. So uh, in any event, uh, please join me in welcoming first, uh, Professor Joshua Sellers. Well, thank you uh, so much for that warm introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming, especially when I understand Fall Fest is happening and you could be uh, listening to music and doing all sorts of other fun things outside. Um, I also wanna thank all the people responsible for making this event uh, possible, the LSU Law Center, of course, for uh, hosting and making the, the space available, uh, the Eric Vogelin Institute, uh, George W. and Jen H. Pugh Institute for Justice, um, the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles in History uh, for the generous sponsorship. Uh, and of course, many thanks to Professor uh, Sue Marchand, who was the Berlin connection that uh, brought me here and, and, and Professor Stoner for extending the invitation. Uh, and also I wanna preemptively thank Professor John Devlin for uh, graciously agreeing to serve as a discussant. So the title of my remarks is uh, The Constitution and American Democracy, uh, which is, I would say, uh, not an uncomplicated relationship uh, between those two things. Uh, for starters, as political theorists and historians and political scientists and others have uh, continually reminded us, democracy is itself a very contested concept. Uh, as noted by the historian Carl Becker, Democracy, like liberty or science or progress, is a word with which we are all so familiar that we rarely take the trouble to ask what we mean by it. Uh, de Tocqueville, the great chronicler of America, um, thought that democracy was defined by the spirit of political equality that he saw uh, in traveling around this country uh, and described it as deeply felt and truly great. The writer E.B. White offered uh, a more playful take on democracy, stating that democracy is the recurrent suspicion that more than half the people are right more than half of the time. Uh, and let us not forget Oscar Wilde's quip. He said, democracy means simply the bludgeoning of the people by the people and for the people. Uh, so a lot of uncertainty about what we mean when we talk about democracy. Scholars have, for their part, focused on certain attributes of our political system, uh, recurrent elections and majority rule and democratic deliberation uh, and the alignment between public preferences and government outcomes to try to identify what the necessary ingredients of democracy are. Uh, but the irresolution that we have over such a simple concept, I think, is revealing and it suggests that maybe democracy is less uh, a type of government as it is a sort of way of living. And I wanna talk a bit about that way of living uh, and the relationship it has to our, our constitution, which is, as many of you know, the oldest written constitution of the world. It facilitates, I think, a certain democratic way of living. Uh, and I think among many other things, one of its great achievements is that of institutional design. 
So as James Madison wrote in Federalist 39, the Republic would derive all of its powers directly or indirectly from uh, the people. And that power is preserved in part through recurrent elections that are guaranteed in, among other places, Article 1, Section 2, right, which gives us uh, the power to vote in House elections every two years. And since 1913, uh, the 17th Amendment was added to the Constitution in 1917. We also have, of course, direct election of senators as well. But crucially, Madison envisioned uh, democratic deliberation occurring not only in and around these periodic elections that we have, but also as a sort of matter of habit among the citizenry. So deliberation in juries, in schools, in taverns, in bars, other places, um, that's where I think he saw democracy flourishing. Uh, now, if you know about James Madison and a lot of the other founders, you know that they also were somewhat worried, skeptical about pure democracy. They were concerned about mob rule or what they called an excess of democracy. And so they sought to you know, mitigate the passions of the people through a system of elite rule and checks and balances and the separation of powers and such. Uh, but I think that the fact that they were so worried about that, that, that type of democracy, the, the ubiquity of democracy shows just how prevalent it was at that time and how prevalent it still is in many places in our country. Now, my own area of expertise, uh, election law, or the, the law of democracy, as it's sometimes called, examines many of the ways that the Constitution shapes contemporary American democracy. So we consider the sort of legal foundation for the right to vote, uh, a right that, again, is it's nowhere expressly included in the constitutional text, uh, what we've come to understand it as being protected. So in election law, we talk about that. We talk about how the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause uh, has been interpreted to prohibit what's known as racial gerrymandering, while on the other hand, uh, tolerating partisan gerrymandering and the sort of complex relationship between those two things. Uh, we focus on how First Amendment jurisprudence evolved to sanction larger and larger campaign expenditures, which in some ways have sort of overwhelmed our politics with all the campaign cash that is flying around. Uh, and we also talk about how political parties occupy a really unique and sort of fascinating constitutional position being sort of quasi-private and quasi-public entities. So as an election law professor, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that these issues aren't immensely important or that there isn't a lot of fascinating law to explore there. Uh, but increasingly, as I focus on these things, I've come to believe that a lot of the sources of our democratic dysfunction uh, and sources of our democratic strain are mostly not constitutional issues. So particularly in law schools, I think we have a tendency to think about constitutionalizing all of these disputes, think about lawsuits that might be filed. But a lot of the issues that we're facing as a country, I don't think are constitutional issues, or at best, you might say the Constitution plays a kind of secondary or, or ceremonial role in resolving those issues. So that's the sort of main point that I want to explore uh, today. I want to discuss how the Constitution and its interpretation, even when it's very clear, right, and in some ways it's clear in saying, you know, each state is guaranteed two senators, for instance, um, it really is about the responsibility that it assigns to us to protect and preserve uh, our democracy independent of any constitutional pronouncements or independent of any constitutional provisions. So it's a kind of spirit of the constitution, I think that maybe should be more the focus than specific provisions when we're thinking about healing our democracy. Um, so I wanna take this occasion and sort of, you know, invert in some ways the idea of a Constitution Day lecture to talk about what it doesn't provide us in terms of uh, helping our democracy and helping us realize our democratic promise. So I wanna discuss three issues that I think are, um, at least a couple of them I think are overlooked in understanding our democratic dysfunction um, and talk about ways in which, again, they're not really constitutional matters. So the first one is, uh, the outsized role that the filibuster plays in our politics. Um, the filibuster, it has a 
you know, so, sort of sordid legacy in terms of how it was used. It was commonly used to stop uh, civil rights legislation. Um, but a lot of people wonder, you know, what is the source of the filibuster? Where does that come from? Well, the source is simply a Senate rule. It's Senate Rule 22 that allows a minority of the Senate to effectively prohibit a vote on any piece of legislation. And historically, aside from the civil rights examples, it was sort of rarely used. Uh, and senators who wanted to object and try to stall legislation were forced to verbally filibuster. They had to take the floor right, and occupy it in order to keep conversation going. So a lot of people will think of Jimmy Stewart in uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and the famous scene where he's filibustering and passes out. Uh, so that's how it, how it used to be. Uh, but things have changed markedly in modern times. Uh, and now senators can exercise what's known as a sort of silent filibuster. And I should just, I should be more specific in describing it. So of course there are 100 senators um, and one senator can now signal, look, me and my faction object to taking this piece of legislation, putting it to a vote. And so now you effectively need uh, 60 senators, right? That's what the rule requires is you need 60 senators to end a filibuster and move something forward. Well, we're living in polarized times, right? It's hard to get 60 senators to agree on anything. So this has a lot of negative effects on our politics. I think this is overlooked to some extent. If you ask a lot of experts, what is the one thing you would change about American politics? Many of them would say I would modify or alter the filibuster. Um, so this chart shows a hundred year time period from 1917 through 2017. And you can just see the market spike uh, in, these are actually cloture motions that are filed. So let me explain what that are. Because we have the silent filibuster now, it's hard to study the filibuster, right? We don't really know when senators are objecting. So the way that scholars measure the uptick in filibustering is when these cloture motions are filed, which would break a filibuster. So that's the sort of metric and measure we can use. We just, you know, otherwise we don't know the numbers. Market spike, as you can see in recent terms, making it, you know, virtually, I don't wanna overstate things, but it's very hard to get legislation enacted now unless you have 60 senators uh, on board. So of course this has widespread implications. So to name just a few, um, substantive legislation of different kinds, whether it's immigration related or climate related or voting rights related, it's nearly impossible, right? To consider legislation like that getting through the Senate. Um, there's a kind of built-in uh, rural favoritism that results from this because smaller states with less population also have two senators. So those interests get sort of overrepresented in Congress, which then Im impacts the type of things that those senators are willing to support, uh, or maybe more importantly, what they're not uh, willing to support. It makes it hard to engage in what political scientists have referred to as retrospective voting, right? We want parties to do things, and then we can judge them on what they do. Maybe we like what they did, maybe we didn't like what they did, but if nothing's really getting done, then it's hard to engage in retrospective voting. And then, you know, more superficial culture war issues take up more oxygen, right? More political grandstanding takes up more oxygen instead of evaluating the parties based on what are you actually doing? Um, I would also note that the filibuster has prevented uh, Washington DC and Puerto Rico from earning statehood. Um, another, you know, controversial issue that is impossible to get past you know, to get 60 senators to agree on. But here's the thing, the filibuster is completely constitutional. There's no constitutional objection that really can be brought, no, no plausible one to the, uh, to the use of the filibuster. Constitution in Article One, Section 5 gives the Senate and the House the power to determine its own rules, right? And, and they can set up committees as they want, they can conduct business as they want, they have decided uh, to preserve the filibuster, at least as applied to legislation. So there's no real constitutional argument that can be made against it to the extent that people wanna change this. It's just a matter of really like putting a lot of pressure on our elected officials to say, we don't like how things are. We wanna see things change. You need to change this, but there's no lawsuit that can be filed. 
So that's one issue I wanted to highlight. Uh, the second one is obvious to many of us, and that is the sort of uh, insularity of media ecosystems and the sort of nefarious effects of social media and misinformation and disinformation. Um, arguably, the absence of shared facts is sort of maybe, you know, one of our principal problems, right, in our, in the, in our democracy right now. Um, there's conspiratorial claims, of course, about uh, elections being stolen. Citizens have very little trust in election administrators, most of whom are just, you know, good citizens who volunteered their time. And now many of these people are under attack uh, and forced to step away from these positions. Um, and there's not a lot of faith and trust in any sort of media objectivity. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I wish I could sort of point to some silver lining, but this particular problem I think seems to be getting worse. Uh, there was a report that just came out a couple of weeks ago by some experts um, pointing out that trust and safety teams have been reduced or eliminated at Meta, uh, at X, uh, of course, formerly known as Twitter, and at Alphabet um, for various reasons, some funding related, some because people have quit, uh, people have been laid off, but these trust and safety teams uh, have been eliminated. Uh, last May, Meta actually scrapped the rollout of like a long project they had to, uh, to engage in fact checking. They've been working on this, working on this for a year and a half. And last spring, as part of the layoffs that uh, you may have read about at Meta, they decided to just you know, scrap, that, scrap that program. Um, there actually, there was a sort of disturbing op-ed uh, this week in the New York Times by someone named Yoel Roth, who was the former head of Twitter's trust and safety team, um, worth reading to see what his experience was like engaging in fact-checking led him to be sort of attacked. He was doxxed. There was, you know, online mob attacks against him. He has been forced to hire armed guards and move his family around many times. So the incentive for sort of taking on these issues um, is not very great. So what does the Constitution have to do with this? Well, again, the theme here is not very much. The Constitution is sort of adjacent to these problems. Um, the most relevant law, which is known as the uh, Communications and Decency Act and Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act, this is the law that uh, shields social media companies from any liability for what the users post. So they're not on the hook for what users post. Now, this might be a smart law, right? There are reasons why this law was enacted. Um, but the reality is, you know, there's no real constitutional argument against this, right? If Congress wants to remedy this problem, they need to amend this law or change the law or do something. But there's no constitutional appeal anyone can make to correct this problem. Uh, the same goes for cable networks, which, of course, can spin the news any way they want to. Um, radio is still sort of the Wild West in a lot of ways as to what is allowed to be said on radio. So again, the reform, the, the avenues for reform of you know, one of, I think, what many people would say is one of our most pressing political issues, the mass consumption of misleading or inaccurate political content is entirely sort of an extra constitutional concern. Okay, the third issue I wanna talk about is um, the negative effects of small dollar campaign contributions. Uh, so this one I think needs to be unpacked a little bit because when you hear this, you say, I don't understand what the problem is. What would be wrong with people sending $25, $50? We want widespread participation. And a lot of good government reformers were trying to get big money out of politics for a long time and encourage people to uh, you know, give small donations. The problem is, um, and again, we, no one really anticipated this at the time, is that small dollar givers tend to be on the fringes or small dollar givers, their views and ideologies are not aligned with the average voter or the average person. Again, no one really anticipated this. It's just that there's a lot of empirical research now showing that those who are most likely to give these small dollar donations don't share the median views of most of us. Um, the reason why there's been this spike in small dollar donations is because now it's easy to donate online, right? So there are groups like Act Blue and 
win red. You can easily contribute small amounts to them. And this chart demonstrates, again, the massive sort of uptick in small donations that we saw between 2018 and 2020. This is the primary way that candidates uh, seek money now. It's not to say they're not still seeking out the big donations, but they're increasingly relying on these small donations. So what, what, are, what are the sort of effects? Well, one is that uh, candidates are less reliant on political parties for campaign funding, right? They don't have to, they used to have to turn to the parties to get funding. Now they can just go to, to people, right? To earn a lot of money through small donations. Um, and then this has sort of led to a real weakening of political parties. So a lot of election law scholars are very concerned about how weak political parties have become and how politicians are now sort of entrepreneurial. You know, they're not beholden to anyone. They have their own media ecosystems and they can again, just go get money uh, from donors. So we think historically about uh, the role that, you know, Senate minority leaders played or prominent speakers of the House played, they were able to, you know, keep members in check, right? They could threaten them either through carrots or sticks, right? By saying, I'm not going to put you on this committee if you don't get on board with the party's agenda. Or I might finance a primary opponent against you if you don't get on, get on the party's agenda. Uh, so think about folks like Sam Rayburn or Tip O'Neill. Uh, or even Newt Gingrich or Nancy Pelosi, you know, we think of them as having power over their members, uh, but that's just not the case anymore. If you've been following the news at all this week, no one would say that about Kevin McCarthy uh, and, and what he's dealing with. The members are not beholden to him uh, in any meaningful way. Um, and so things have changed drastically. And I want to show this chart from uh, opensecrets.org, which is sort of a great source for tracking campaign donations. The, the font is a little small here. I apologize. This is the top of a list showing the, uh, the members of Congress that received the highest percentage of their donations from small donors. So at the top of the list is Bernie Sanders. Okay. 70.25% of his donations last cycle were from small donors. Now, Bernie Sanders, whatever you think about him, uh, his views aren't that of the average Democrat. Uh, and here he is getting the vast majority of his money from small donors. Marjorie Taylor Greene, controversial, outspoken member of Congress, 68 percent. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 67 percent. Matt Gates, Jim Jordan, Adam Schiff, Katie Porter. If you know these names, it's because these folks are in the media a lot, right? They have their own ecosystems. Um, they have agendas. And so there's a correlation here, right? As a political scientist, I wouldn't necessarily say there's direct causation, but there's a clear correlation between who's giving to these candidates and the type of positions that they hold. So, you know, I don't know precisely what to do about this. It's another instance where this is not a constitutional issue. Uh, now, some of you might say, I thought campaign finance law was a constitutional issue. And that's true, but that's not true for small donors, right? That's never been understood to be a sort of constitutional problem. If you look historically at campaign finance law, it's a history of trying to regulate certain sources of money. And historically, it was mostly, let's not let corporations give, or let's not let labor unions give. Um, or it's been trying to limit the amount of money that you can give. So let's put contribution caps in place because we're worried about corruption. That's sort of the underlying concern with campaign finance law is we don't want to allow for corruption. Uh, well, small donors don't really raise the prospect of corruption. No one would say, if I gave $50 to a candidate, they're beholden to me in some meaningful way. So constitutional law doesn't really have much to do here with this small donor problem. Um, so where does that leave us? Uh, so if profoundly destabilizing issues like the ones that I've highlighted, gridlock that results from the filibuster, the spread of misinformation and disinformation, distrust of the media, and then the unanticipated effects of the increase of these small dollar contributions, if there's no constitutional remedy for them, how can we respond? Well, some 
law professors have started writing more and more about constitutional norms or constitutional conventions, informal rules that historically kind of dictated how government officials acted or what, the, what was guiding their representational behavior and actions. And the idea there, and the reason I think these scholars have gravitated towards this, is to try to identify and defend beliefs that are in line with like the spirit of the constitution. So if you take an oath of office, you should, uh, the idea is try to uh, effectuate the spirit of the constitution and you should take action on certain issues if you, know, you see these democratic problems that are flourishing. So as put by one scholar, constitutional norms help vindicate the basic purposes of the constitutional system that law alone cannot accomplish. Um, so there's been a lot of attention paid to that. And we could imagine, we could at least theorize that, you know, good governance norms would sort of take over and we would have Congress saying, you know what, let's do away with the filibuster or let's at least modify it and make members actually hold the floor like used to be the case. Maybe we could get legislation to combat some of this misinformation and disinformation. Maybe we could have a sort of bipartisan commitment to public financing of elections. Let's just get private donations totally out of politics. Let's, you know, change campaign finance entirely. Um, I admire a lot of the scholars who are advancing these positions, but I'm very dubious of this. I mean, there's no reason to think that norms are going to sudden, suddenly be resurrected and, you know, incentivize members to change uh, their behavior. So ultimately, um, what I want to end with is saying, you know, the responsibility for democratic renewal uh, is ours and it's ours alone. It's, it's, it's not a legal issue that can be solved again through litigation. Um, the constitution of course does supply us with, you know, rights that are important to pushing for change, whether it's rights to free speech or to petition the government or to associate or assemble, uh, obviously to vote, right? All of those rights are incredibly important and, necessary ingredients, but they're not sufficient. Um, and it doesn't, those rights don't free us of the labor that's required to bring about change. Um, that's labor that has to happen in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, in our schools and institutions of higher learning like this, um, libraries, cafes, right? That's where I think the real prospects for change lie. Uh, there was a report put out a couple of years ago by project with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. You can Google this, pull it up, it's free. Um, I think it's worth looking at. It's the best thing I've read to sort of lay out some of these principles of civic participation. One of the uh, professors who was involved with this is the political theorist, Danielle Allen at Harvard, who is a great sort of spokesperson for restoring our civic culture. Um, so I'd recommend taking a look at this. Uh, but we have to deliberate with one another. We have to converse uh, with one another. And I want to close with a quote from another political theorist, uh, Sheldon Wolin, who was uh, one of the more sort of astute theorists of democracy over the past century. Uh, and he has an essay called Fugitive Democracy, where he wrote, quote, in my understanding, democracy is a project concerned with the political potentialities of ordinary citizens. That is with their possibilities for becoming political beings through the self-discovery of common concerns and modes of action for realizing them. So my hope is that uh, the process of uh, self-discovery that we all engage in and collectively we engage in uh, will rejuvenate and re-energize our democracy in the years to come. Thank you. Our discussant is Professor John Devlin of the law school. Let me see if I can see, I will see if I can get them on. Uh, if people in the booth are hearing, I am being told that the video and the audio went away somehow. Oh, okay, let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Unfortunately, the mouse doesn't seem to want to work. Um, 
The mouse is not working. I just want to get up there. I mean, no, I just... Don't worry. Let me... Okay. Well, I think we need to do it here. But in any event, let, let me begin for those who are here. Um, and again, thank you, Professor uh, Sellers, for speaking to us today and providing a provocative and insightful set of remarks. Uh, I do not intend to speak for very long. Uh, the students in the audience, at least the law students, I think are, are well, all of you are here to he hear Professor Sellers, and at least the law students can uh, hear me anytime they want. Uh, my role, I think, is to suggest some possible lines of discussion or possibilities for questions. Uh, the main thrust of Professor Sellers' remarks, as I understand it, has been what some might call a council of restraint, uh, that not all problems are constitutional problems, or maybe even a council of despair, uh, that there are some things that our laws and our legal traditions cannot help us with. Um, and there is great truth in that, right? That there are issues that we will have to, again, in, in Professor Seller's thesis, deal with in other ways. But again, think about that for a moment. What are those other ways? Now, it is possible that there will be a wonderful resurgence of civic consciousness. I, I agree with you. That would be great. I would, will join you in working toward it. I share your skepticism that that will happen anytime soon. Uh, it may be done through the ballot box or through legislation. Uh, it may be done as we did in 1861 through violence. Um, there are other ways other than through law by which problems can be solved. But it does seem to me there's some value in doing them through law uh, if indeed it is possible to do it that way. I don't disagree with Professor Sellers that ultimately the responsibility of our, is ours. Um, but I do suggest, and again, let me suggest here that the Constitution may still have some role to play in at least some of the problems that just that uh, Professor Sellers raised. Uh, first, with respect to um, the problem of political polarization, whether that's reflected in the gerrymander or in the extreme weakness of Spe Speaker McCarthy, who could, by the way, stand up to the extreme elements of his own party and pass whatever legislation he needed to simply by reaching across the aisle and agreeing to work on a bipartisan basis for reasons having to do with internal pol party politics and polarization. He is unwilling to do that, though that option is there. Well, where does that, sorry, uh, where does that polarization come from? Well, many sources, obviously, but one of them is gerrymandered congressional districts and on the state level, gerrymandered legislative districts. Well, is that an issue on which the Constitution may have something to say? Again, just to be clear, I imagine most of you know what I mean by this, but a gerrymandered district, one that's gerrymandered for partisan reasons, we're not talking about racial gerrymandering here, but partisan gerrymandering, where a district is drawn in such a way with boundaries so as to include within that, that district all of the people that will vote for your party and as few as possible of the people who will vote for the other party. That'd be one way of doing it. There are others. But in that kind of gerrymandered district, a candidate running for office suffer, faces no realistic threat from the other party. Rather, the only threat to their continued career is an internal threat where some other candidate from that person's own party can better appeal to the activist base, can better appeal to those who turn out to give money for or vote in primaries. Um, that's a situation that tends to drive those candidates more and more and more away from the center of politics, more and more and more away from the edges. In contrast, non-gerrymandered districts, districts that have significant numbers of people of both parties, significant numbers of swing voters, the incentives are different. Every candidate wants to be able to win the general election, knows that in order to do so, they have to appeal to the center. That drives the politicians, drives their policies toward a more centrist position. Again, polarization, many causes, but one of them is gerrymandering. Well, this is an issue on which the Supreme Court in 1986, in a case called Davis versus Bandemer, floated the idea that partisan gerrymandering would violate the Equal Protection Clause in its role as a protector of 
the equal voting rights of all citizens, that gerrymandering was constitutionally questionable, both because it essentially deprives some voters of any effective role in the outcome of an election. You know going into it that your vote doesn't matter. Um, and also because it skews results that the ultimate composition of the legislative body or Congress does not reflect the will of the people. Well, the court raised the issue that that is something that might be a constitutional question. But a couple of years ago, uh, in 2019, in the case called Rucho, R-U-C-H-O, the Supreme Court closed the door and said that any such challenges to partisan gerrymandering are inherently non-justiciable political questions. Courts may not even listen to ch such challenges, much less rule in favor of them. Can't even hear them. Right. Another issue uh, having to do with campaign finance. Uh, Professor Sellers focused on the surprising and novel problem of the radicalizing effect of small donors. But let me go back to the, you know, the old problem, the old concern of the corrupting effect of large donors, which has not gone away. The new problem is here, was, is with us, but the old problem didn't go away. Um, in a series of decisions going back to 1976, a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, but extending uh, into more recent times, Federal Elections Commission of Wisconsin, Citizens United, and in a whole series of other cases, the Supreme Court, particularly though not exclusively the current court, uh, has held that donations of money should be treated as the equivalent of speech for purposes of First Amendment protection. That corporations and entities like PACs or other kinds of fictional creations like this should be treated as if they had the same fundamental rights of speech that a human being would have. And as a result, the court has basically struck down pretty much all efforts by the federal government to control large donor campaign contributions. And again, what's the consequence of that? Well, I think you know in the audience probably even better than I, but increasingly, particularly I suspect among younger voters, but increasingly among all voters, there is a growing sense that the system is corrupt, that voting does not matter, that money talks. Um, and again, that is profoundly co co corrosive to what it is we're trying to do as a democracy. Again, my, my point here is, is not that the Constitution can solve all problems. It cannot. But there are some things where fundamental principles as expressed in the Constitution could play a role. The court has consistently over the last 20, 30 years interpreted the Constitution so as to make it not play a role in protecting democracy. But those are choices. Right? The kinds of cases that, that, that I have referred to are cases where the text, the structure, the drafting history of the Constitution could have supported a different interpretation, one that would have been more protective of democracy. And let me suggest a, a, a set of ideas perhaps, and this is very rough again, I'm, I'm gonna sit down, you all, you all need to be taking over here with questions. But there is ground on which one could systematically reinterpret the constitution in a way that would protect the constitution or protect our democratic norms. One possible approach to constitutional interpretation, one that is used in many courts throughout the world, uh, the constitutional courts of Canada, of South Africa, and some others have been prominent, but it is common, is the idea that you need to, to interpret the document in a purposive way. What's that mean? That you take into account what it is the drafters and the ratifiers, the people who created the constitution. What is it that they were trying to achieve? and you interpret the Constitution so as to help achieve those fundamental purposes. Well, we are lucky. Um, our Constitution in its preamble actually states what its purposes are. It says that it is being in enacted uh, for particular purposes, to form a more per a perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, 
to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. There is ground here. We can talk about it in terms of constitutional norms, but it seems to me there's also some constitutional text that the constitution can also play a role in protecting democracy. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna ask the speakers to mic up with their uh, mics so they don't have to pop up and down every time. And, uh, uh, but I'm gonna open the floor for questions. So the floor is now open for questions. We have about uh, 15 minutes. And if they don't throw us out, we have a few minutes extra. So who would like to start? Yes, question from the back. Stand up if you could and speak as loudly as you can. And then I'll try to repeat. And don't go too long because I'll repeat what you said. Good question about the two party system. Absolutely. Can you hear me with this? Absolutely could uh, remain functional. Yeah. Uh, we know plenty of other countries have multi party systems. They can work. A number of years ago, I think there was a real common view that uh, if we move to a multi party system, we'd be much better off. Our democracy would be healthier. Uh, some recent developments in countries with multi-party systems has sort of led people to question that assumption now, right? A lot of multi-party systems are dealing with a lot of these same issues. They have the same strains. They have the same friction. So it's not like multi-party systems are necessarily like a panacea uh, for you know, problems of democracy. I'll tell you what the problem, though, as I see it, is that our system makes it extraordinarily difficult for third parties to get a foothold. And they do that through what you might call sort of bipartisan collusion of sorts. I mean, the laws, this is where election law really does come into play. It's extraordinarily hard to get the number of signatures it requires to get a third party on the ballot and such. So law is a real impediment from everything from being a, uh, able to nominate a candidate, but also to even getting on a debate stage in some instances. Um, so there is a there's a real challenge that third parties face. Now, you didn't ask about this, but you know there is this effort by no labels, right, to try to mount a third party challenge. We'll see where that goes, um, but there is uh, an uphill battle, let's say, for any third party that wants to have any reasonable uh, claim at a, I think, a, a federal election. At the state level, there might be some more room to maneuver, but even there, I think it's hard to break the foothold of the uh, the two major parties. Go ahead, John. Can I add that there also is a constitutional issue here. Federal constitution sets up Congress, and most, and I think every state uh, constitution sets up a state legislature where people run for single member districts. So, in order for a new party to have any representation at all, they have to actually get a plurality or a majority of the votes in some. And that's tough when you're getting started, right? The Green Party, for example, in European countries, they can get 10% of the vote, and because they have a different system, that means they get 10% of the parliament. Here, unless you get 50% plus one of the vote somewhere, you get nothing in the of the And that also makes it very hard for the new party to Another question, thank you. Yes. Surveys show that's the case. Yeah, there is a lot of apathy and frustration and um, skepticism about institutions. And a lot of those uh, claims, I think, are well-founded, right? I mean, the parties for a very long time have not worked for large segments of the population. You can understand frustration with that. The real question, I think, is what happens with that frustration? How does that manifest? And is it productive? You know, and I think, unfortunately, in recent years, a lot of that frustration, even if it's legitimately felt, is put in bad places or like harmful places. Uh, so one of the challenges, you know, in restoring civil culture is figuring out how can we first recognize, and appreciate and apprehend these frustrations 
and then respond to them. And I think the, the parties can both be blamed, right, for not doing that effectively. Let, let me push back on that a little bit. Two of the last three presidential candidates who were successful in winning the presidency came from outside the partisan establishment. In 2008, uh, Hillary Clinton had almost a lock on the party establishment, and Barack Obama proved that change was possible by running a campaign that was really different in its in, in its uh, character and, uh, uh, and and certainly brought all sorts of new voices into politics, not least his own. Uh, Donald Trump was hardly the choice of the mainstream Republican Party, and yet he came to uh, dominate uh, the party for a while, coming very much from outside. So it seems to me now, Biden, that's the example of what you get from when the party leaders choose uh, choose the president. Maybe you like it and maybe uh, maybe you can see there's some limits there. Although, although those were folks who worked within an existing party structure, even though they attacked it from the outside. Oh, so that's not, what these were not third parties. Well, no, that's right. That's right. But they were they they challenged the notion that the parties were themselves um, hard blocks uh, and hard or organizations rather than loose and flexible coalitions that could be changed. I mean, Obama is the best one to read on this. I always felt because uh, uh, because he always said uh, when you're apathetic, but you can change within the system. And I I thought he proved that. And maybe not. Maybe you disagree on that. Other questions? Yes. I think only one of us saw them as constitutional issues. So maybe Professor Sellers should 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 answer first. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I you know, I, I tried to emphasize that sort of the responsibility lies with us um, in putting pressure on our leaders to address some of these issues. Um, but there's been a sort of status quo bias against action on a lot of major issues. I mean, it's you know, when you live long enough, uh, you just start seeing these things replay themselves. It's like the immigration issue just won't go away. That just keeps resurrecting in new forms, right? Um, questions about, you know, uh, whether we're going to limit some types of guns or put restrictions on gun purchases, you know, decade after decade, it's the same thing. Social safety net questions. So, you know, um, to go back to my prior comments, I mean, you can understand from like an average voter's perspective that they just don't see the needle moving in a meaningful way on some of these these big issues. Um, now, the solution, I don't, I don't think there's any one single solution, but I do think that a lot of the momentum probably needs to come from uh, engaged citizens, right, who collectively sort of say, we are demanding change on this. Um, and that's what politicians are going to respond to, right? They more than anything, want to keep their jobs. And there are recent examples, right? If we want to be positive, we can say there are recent examples of groups of people getting together and saying, we're not going to tolerate this or we want change on this. And it is worth considering moments when you do see politicians respond to that in, in sort of surprising ways. Can I add? Hey, Let me add to that. I, I, I profoundly agree with Professor Sellers. I mean, ultimately, democracy will rise or fall depending on whether or not we as a people continue to earn it, and we earn it by our behavior every day. There's a wonderful quote um, from uh, Ben Franklin as he exited the Constitutional Convention in 1787 after they had signed it, and some woman of Philadelphia ran up to him and said, you know, Dr. Franklin, what is it that you have given us? And his answer was, Madam, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. And that's the point, right? We have to keep it, and it is profoundly up to the collective us to do that. My point, though, <laughs> is that there are some of these issues where saying the Constitution is irrelevant is a choice, not an inevitability. There are some issues where the Constitution could play a role. And it, it does seem to me maybe a bad idea to absolve the Supreme Court, to absolve the legal system of any responsibility. Though I agree that's probably a secondary responsibility. One, one more historical uh, note. In, in the uh, 1790s, Congress passed the Sedition Act, which essentially made it illegal to 
criticized the federal government and was used by the then dominant Federalist Party to put many of their Democratic Republican um, opponents in jail. Now, you would think, my golly, if there's anything that violates the First Amendment, freedom of speech, got to be that, right? Nobody went to court. Nobody talked about the First Amendment. Instead, there was a revolt of the voters, and the Federalist Party was voted out of office in the elections of 1800, never to gain power ever again. And it was, it, and that that's where the framers put their primary faith was in the democratic instincts of the people, the power of the ballot box. What's worrisome about some of the things Professor Sellers is talking about is that it, it's like AIDS. It, it, it corrupts the process that is supposed to be used to defend the country. It's corrupting the political process itself. And that's, I think, where the profound danger comes. I just want to uh, offer an addendum. So to the extent that there's any tension between what we're saying, which I don't think- Not, not a whole lot. No. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's just a temporal issue, right? So I, I entirely agree that um, people should be advancing, let's say, alternate constitutional visions, right? That, that's essentially what you're saying, is that in the, the, in the long term, if we look at the long horizon, it's important to have an alternate constitutional vision to the current one if you want change. And you need to be ready with arguments to be able to say, you should be interpreting this clause differently. There's a different way to understand this provision, what have you. And a lot of great scholars, uh, including one of my colleagues, Willie Forbath, mm -hmm. you know, has a whole you know book on the anti-oligarchy constitution, as he calls it. So there's other there's work to be done in that regard. But I'm responding to the current moment where a lot of the things that Professor Devlin mentioned are not realistic with the composition of the court as it currently is. I would love for the court to revisit Citizens United in Buckley versus Vallejo. That's not going to happen. I would love if they would have taken, as I said in an amicus brief, take the same approach we use to police racial gerrymandering. Yep. That would work for partisan gerrymandering. They didn't do that. They, in the Ruscio case, said partisan gerrymandering is non-justiciable. So I'm just saying this court is not going to move on these issues. We're not going to get an alternate outcome from them. But you know what? The composition can change quicker than I think people realize. And you need to be ready with an alternate vision, just as, by the way, the people who are fans of this current court had an alternate vision that they had developed over many decades and were ready to implement when the time came. Good. Another question from the back. Yes. I, I would say the framers believe that, right? And again, that is one of the difficulties sometimes of constitutional interpretation. The framers' generation, both those who wrote and those who ratified, debated, voted for the Constitution, that generation believed in natural rights. I'm not sure today we do. Today we think of legal entitlements as being more um, something that is decreed in some document somewhere, a statute or a constitution, not something that's inherent. But I, I, it's only a partial answer to your question, but I would say the framers did that. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, I think uh, the, the, the way we conceive of rights is itself interesting um, because even if we don't speak in the tenor of natural rights today, I think many people think along those lines that, you know, I have a right to this, therefore you can't infringe on it. And oftentimes, many people are very confused about that type of thing, right? You are working for a private employer who polices your speech. A lot of people say, I have a free speech right. It doesn't apply in that context, right? The government is not prohibiting you from speaking. Your private employer can fire you if they don't like what you said. So but there's a, there's a felt notion that people have, right, that they have these strong rights. Um, they often are incorrect about that in some cases, but in other instances, it's also true that these rights um, have exceptions, right? In, in law school, you learn that all that having a right means is that a balancing test has to be conducted. It doesn't assure that your right will be upheld. Um, so there's always sort of additional questions to ask. And um, 
you know, we can privilege certain rights, but at the end of the day, it's it's also a matter of how we sort of balance those rights against competing interests and how, you know, all that gets sorted out. But can, can I just highlight something you said? Because I, th I think it was profound and it, it goes to the question you asked. I think you're right. Popular culture does still have heavy echoes of natural rights, natural law, natural rights thinking, but that's not our legal culture. And I wonder if, ma'am, and I think this may be the fundamental point you're making in your question, that divergence between popular culture and legal culture may be one of the issues that is driving some of these problems. Go ahead, follow up if you'd like. So which is more democratic then? The popular culture, which believes in natural rights and, and still thinks the declaration is the anchor of our, uh, our, our order, or is it uh, the lawyers and the legal culture, which uh, treats natural rights as, if not, as Bentham said, nonsense on stilts and stuff for undergraduate courses and not for serious uh, law professors and judges who uh, have power. Jim, is that, if that's a serious question, I have a serious answer. It is a serious question, John. Yeah. Popular culture can often become sort of, and I'm, I'm intentionally using the legally, or sorry, the historically loaded phrase, it be, can become volkish culture. It can become the idea of blood and soil and we are, that I as a politician, it's, it's the root of populism, that I as a politician simply have to give voice to the deeper instincts, romantic notions, perhaps dangerous urge for self-aggrandizement of my Volk, my people. Um, I think popular culture can be dangerous. The, the One of the, the good things about legal culture is that it can be a check, it can be a rein, it can be a limit on what may be the excesses of popular culture. Well, and John, if that's a serious answer, I have a serious response to the answer, <laughs> which is, which is, but natural rights is not folkish. The whole point no, of natural is, rights is that each of us has, as a human being, given our nature, certain basic rights, I, and it I'm is not you. only because you're German or because you're well, French or very, because you're uh, white or black. No, these are rights that just as a human being. So if there, if democracy depends on real public support for the idea of democracy, it seems to me that natural rights is a pretty good place to anchor it I'm, if you want equality for everyone and that the, the legal culture can take its own turns I think that lose track to, of the natural basis of what they think. This will, You and I need to do a different debate. This would be fun. I think it would be great fun. <laughs> I don't know if we can get anybody to come, but what I the heck? We'll we'll in on this. Good. Other questions from uh, the uh, from the floor, or or uh, Dr. Sellers, if yeah. you want to uh, check. No, I, I don't have anything to add. I, I think the um, just repeating what I said before. To the extent that people think of rights as sort of inalienable, mm -hmm. that's if nothing else, sort of sociologically interesting, right? Now, where they anchor them, I mean, most people wouldn't say, "I feel this way because I think I have some natural law right to it," but there may be some thread that connects. It'd be interesting to know what do people think of as being the like firmament, right? And the strongest version of the rights they have. They might be inaccurate legally, you know, in terms of how lawyers talk about it, but it's still worth knowing how people conceive of their role, of their place as citizens vis-a-vis -vis the government. You know, when these pocket constitutions first came out, I have a, a different version that was uh, issued initially by the... Um, uh, misplaced, uh, misplaced. I have to get a new one. Uh, uh, that was uh, originally put out by the um, Bicentennial Commission on the Constitution, and they printed the Constitution and the amendments. But then someone said, "Wait a minute, we ought to have the Declaration of Independence in there. That's where the natural rights are mentioned." And now you'll see every one of them, including the one that's here for you to take, includes the Declaration of Independence. And of course, it's at the beginning of the U.S. Code as one of our organic laws and I think still belongs to the people and not yet to the judges. <laughs> In any event, uh, we have hit our time and uh, I'd welcome you to come up if you have additional questions, but please join me in thanking our speakers today, especially Dr. Sellers. That was fun. Thank you. That was fun.